Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I've Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Okay, y'all, we're back with part two of Women and Romance. And we kind of teased it before. So we're talking movies, video games, and music. And we kind of just, uh, oh, it's a lot. There's yeah. a lot in here. So mm-hmm. uh, if you want to, you don't have to. You can also check out part one where we already looked into uh, novels and fan fiction as well. And it definitely had a lot in there (laughs) about all of that. And so moving right along, I want to name off some famous lines and see if you know what movie they are from. Oh, okay. Okay. And these are all epic romance movies. Okay. See, I'm very competitive, but I don't have a lot of experience in this field, so I'm... A lot of emotions. <laughs> I, I try to find very broad, very famous ones. Okay. So I feel you should, because I pulled the one off about Casablanca and Have or Have Not, which is put your lips together and blow. <laughs> I took that off because I didn't think you would know what that nope. movie was. So, first line. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Gone with the wind. There you go. That's one. Second one. No one puts baby in the corner. Don't know. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I've never known where that was from. <laughs> okay, well, that is Dirty Dancing. Okay. All right, well, now all right which has many a remakes. I feel like I'm going to have to make you watch some of it, <laughs> at the very least. And then there's, a, I'll never let go, Jack. I'll never let go. Titanic, which I have not and seen. She, she pushed him off the thing, essentially. <laughs> um, just so you know. Oh, wow. And then this line, As you wish. The Princess Bride. Yes. Yes. And then you complete me. Jerry Maguire. There you go. So, okay, okay, okay. Four out of five ain't bad. Uh, I'm very, like a, very surprised, though, that you didn't know Dirty Dancing. Although, I'm not going to lie, that was the one I was like, you may not know this one. Uh, you know. Because it is an 80s movie, and you didn't do too much with 80s romance, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> Which, by the way, so have you seen any of those movies? I've seen Jerry Maguire and Gone with the Wind. Yes. Okay. You've never seen Princess Bride? Oh, yeah. I've seen Princess Bride. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cute. That was shocking. Oh, that yeah. would have been shocking. But yeah, so that's our introduction. I'm, I'm very impressed with what you did. Aww. though. But yeah, <laughs> let's talk about movies. Yes. So when it comes to movies, romance is one of the most popular genres. And there are... Tons and tons and tons, just so many of them. But first, as we like to do, let's do some definitions. A romance film is a genre where the plot revolves around the love between two main characters as they endure the highs and lows of love. They are love stories that focus on passion, emotion, and romantic involvement of the main protagonist. And they have common themes like love at first sight, obsessive, tragic, sexual, passionate, and so many other types of love. Right. And uh, the first romance film was called The May Irwin Kiss, or sometimes known as The Kiss, and it was made in 1896. It was an 18-second film that showed two actors kissing. And yeah, you guessed it. It caused quite a stir, to the point it got scathing reviews, as well as the fact that the Roman church publicly denounced this film. And even when it was being screened, police would be called to shut it down. Wow. 18 (laughs) seconds. (laughs) Ah, 18 seconds of passion. (laughs) Oh, no. And also something to note, the first discovered silent black romance movie was created in 1898 called Something Good. And the first discovered queer film was made in 1919 called Different from the Others. And it was based around two gay men falling in love. It was apparently is a tragedy. Not surprising. No. <laughs> Let's talk about the subgenres there are within romance. So there are several subgenres. And before we take a deep dive into specific movies, we wanted to break some of them down, including the epic romance, and it can be traced back to good old literature or historical romance novels. Books like Gone with the Wind, which you already talked about, which is considered still one of the most popular romance movies out there, and many of Jane Austen books like Pride and Prejudice or Emma that continue to be remade over and over and over again. Yep. There's also romantic drama. Um, now, this is one of the two main subgenres, and these are usually big budget movies like Titanic, which we are going to discuss a little bit more later, and include classics like Casablanca. These movies are more complex and look at the depth of the ups and downs of relationships, whether it's death, infidelity, or even love triangles. There's a lot of love triangles. There are. (laughs) (laughs) And then you have the romantic comedy. Now, this would be the other main subgenre within 
romance, the rom-com, is the combination of love plus laughter that makes the genre so popular. And of course, we kind of talked a bit about some of these movies before when we talked about movies like Sleepless in Seattle and even Sex in the City, which by the way, may be more of a chick flick, which we'll talk a bit more about as well. And there's a 20-year period referred to as the era of romantic comedy, which is from 1990 to 2010, which those movies kind of fit in that time frame. Um, and it was during this time you had movies like You've Got Mel, While You Were Sleeping, and many, many more. That's funny. I didn't know that that was an era, but my dad, who loved movies, like love, love, love movies, he would get me, like any holiday, he would get me a movie. And for a while, he was getting me all these like rom-coms. And some of them I never <laughs> even like tore the plastic oh. off. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. So chick flicks, yes. This is a more modern subgenre than the others. And it's more of a tag to romantic comedies, maybe a sub-subgenre, if you will. This is specified as more of a, quote, niche of romance films. And it's specifically marketed more towards women or maybe created by women or starring women and combines comedy, drama, and romance. Right, and that's a nicer version of what we're talking about when we say chick flick, just so you know. Um, and then there's paranormal romance. And here we're talking about movies like Twilight and its entire series, which, by the way, are all on one list as some of the highest grossing romance movies in history. But the subgenre is a hybrid of sorts that combines supernatural fantasy with romance. So we talked a bit about in our part one of why women like romance, but why do women love these movies? Is it the relationships or maybe the meet cutes? And what are some of the problems and reasons that romance is not as accepted a genre? Outside of just the hope that it can give us in finding that true love, there may be neurological reasons romantic movies are liked. According to one group of neuroscientists at Princeton University, as someone sees a story and that story resonates or impacts them, levels of oxytocin go up. And when a story is told well, the oxytocin is released into the bloodstream and makes your brain react as if we are actually experiencing these stories. It's as if you are falling in love yourself. Aww. So sweet. And with romantic comedies, uh, we see arguments for both negative and positive of rom-coms. Many say that it undermines women in different ways. Historically, rom-coms were known to be lagging in diversity, focused on the cis-hetero relationships that often make women to be the unattainable ideals, specifically for the male gaze, of course, kind of like the pixie manic girl that kind of trope. Mm -hmm. There are definitely a lot of problematic themes in all of romance, whether we're talking about the stalkerish obsession or rapey meetings. Yeah, that's a yeah. And there are definitely tropes that should be immediately thrown out the window. We're looking at you, 16 Candles. <laughs> but it can also be argued that being able to enjoy something without overanalyzing it can be worthwhile, especially through a traumatizing pandemic. It's a nice distraction from what could be a bad day. As Arabelle Sicardi wrote in her article in Elle, Watching a good rom-com is like going on a fun first date with yourself. It makes you excited and curious about this puddle of feelings inside of you. Yeah, I thought that was a sweet way of putting it. Mm -hmm. But as one article states, there is often misrepresentation, specifically in rom-coms, which women are always the underlying vying for the attention of supervisors or men in roles of authority, the teacher, the CEO, the boss, or women who are seeking to have it all, including the perfect guy, and not being fulfilled without them. Right. But also the conversation of the overall mass consumption of the expectation of what women are supposed to be or supposed to look like is a huge conversation. I mean, in what world is Anne Hathaway, or Annie, apparently, as she likes to be called? I know. Right? In, in what world is she the dowdy girl turned princess? I mean, her curly hair too straight made her a princess, or mm -hmm. beautiful, I guess? Or Drew Barrymore, the lonely nerd that no one wants and no one wants to kiss? Yeah. Like a never been kiss? Come on. But what happens when we start unconsciously comparing ourselves to these dowdy celebrity characters? As the same article states, quote, we consciously and unconsciously internalize these cultural norms, evaluating ourselves and others in comparison to them, usually without conscious awareness we grow trying to emulate whatever culture seems to be most valuable because we all want to be desired, loved, and wanted. Yeah, and that's something else I've been thinking about lately is I feel like we don't have this conversation as much anymore. But a while back, there was a big conversation about like, are we teaching young people and young girls specifically a very unrealistic level of love and like what love looks right. like and you're not I mean there's certain aspects you're just not going to show the boring days right but, right. but having those 
expectations of this. It, only this is love. And if only they got to rent a carriage and do this and this and this, you know. Those kinds <laughs> they got to be shy, but open and right. vulnerable. But, you yeah. know, actually, one other article that I read, which was a review about romantic realism versus ideal and fantasy, it actually doesn't have a lot of correlation. They hmm. state that just kind of like what we talked about with the novels, the realization is it is fantasy. Yeah. And we want to escape. And this is a part of the escapism mm-hmm. that kind of comes into it. And so there's not a, even though we have concerns and we we do have obvious obsessions and or uh, loves and drives and pushes, mm-hmm. for the most part, people know, teenagers too, that it is not reality. Yeah. Although, doesn't mean we're not trying for it. Yeah. And I find that really interesting. I, I because I haven't really heard that side of it before, that it's escapism. And when you said that, it totally made sense to me. I'm like, of course, like we sort of know that's generally not how life is going to work, <laughs> but that's why I like this. Exactly. <laughs> but, okay, have all of these thoughts and concerns we've been discussing also placed a shame factor in enjoying these romance movies. There are so many articles talking about healthy and unhealthy concepts of romance and what is being depicted versus reality, but I guess we would also say that a part of the argument is the need to dismiss the success of these movies as being frivolous or, uh, yeah, like later named as chick flicks due to the fact that women enjoy them and many are targeted to women. And of course... In our society, that means it doesn't have any value. (laughs) And by the way, the term chick flick originally meant a sexually explicit film. But in 1989, it was used to describe the movie Still Magnolias, which, have you ever seen that? Have we talked about this? Mm -mm. Oh, it's very sad. And due to the fact that it featured predominantly an all-female cast, as well as the fact the majority of the audience Mm -hmm. was female. And then it was used to reference Thelma and Louise and Fried Green Tomatoes. And what do these two movies have in common? Strong female leads. And the term eventually included all in any movie that had a female lead or influence. Movies like Wild with Reese Witherspoon or love stories like While You Were Sleeping, they all somehow got swept into the category of chick flick, which is not only dismissive, <laughs> but demeaning and the mere oversimplification of so many different and strong movies. And it's often to dismiss its credibility of being a compelling film. Right. And yeah, it does go in hand with the fact that women cannot be taken seriously as the leading protagonist and that women aren't funny. Or that if it is geared towards women, it's not a serious contender. We sort of talked about that with the comparisons between Sex and the City and The Sopranos. So how could any movie that has both of these things be taken seriously? And though it has not been seen as a big moneymaker Recently, it still holds large viewership and interest. Like, if you just look at the newest series, Bridgerton, which is a historical romance that is the most watched series on Netflix, it has problematic issues, which we will address. But that aside, it stands to show romance is far from dead. And as we know, when it's created by men, it's legitimate. And when created by women, oh, it's cute. That's cute. It's just cute. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of these movies. The classic historical romance. Titanic. Uh, There's so much we can say to the plot of the 1997 film, a rich girl, a poor boy, a very obvious disaster, and a giant diamond that she throws back into the ocean. For the love of God, why? (laughs) Take that thing, girl. Though it was one of the highest grossing movies at the time, which made $1.8 billion then, I believe, around that time, and then an overall $2.19 billion as of 2020. And it earned 14 Academy Award nominations with 11 actual wins, including Best Picture. One thing to note that James Cameron obviously is the director and creator of this movie. So it may be more, as we were saying, credited yeah. as a success because it was directed and created by a man. Right. Of course, and also there is tragedy in there, uh, which it's makes it serious. taken a little seriously. Yeah. Right. And it was number one in the box office for 15 straight weeks. It was a huge success, but it's definitely a love-hate film. It appealed to so many, whether it was young teenagers wanting to romance and a little bit of Leo <laughs> or the pure joy or judgment of historians with what's happened uh, with the Titanic or those who came to see the morbid results of an impending tragedy. People love it, right? I guess. Right? <laughs> and word of mouth helped spread its success for the 15 weeks it stayed at number one. I definitely, this was one of the movies I went to see at the theaters, not realizing I was going to come out ugly crying and being <laughs> depressed for the next three days. <laughs> I am ashamed to admit that I, at the time, 
I was a very contrarian kid. So if everybody liked something, then I didn't like it. Like, that was right. a really annoying trait that I had. And everybody liked Leonardo DiCaprio, and I refused to get in on it. And to this day, I haven't seen Titanic. And my ex-boyfriend, who loved this movie, tried to get me to watch it. It was really late. And, like, within the first 10 minutes, I was, like, kind of... I wouldn't say bored, but just I was tired. And he was like, you have to be awake to appreciate this. So he turned it off and I've never seen it since. <laughs> I would never make you watch this movie. I, honestly, I've only seen it once, but it definitely, I remember it. Yeah. To the T. Maybe because of all the memes, but you know. I mean, yeah, it's certainly it seeped into our cultural psyche where even though I haven't seen it, I know like five or six big moments in it. Like I know about it. I mean, I still argue to the point, why couldn't Jack just get it on the damn door? <laughs> Maybe Jack was a ghost. Anyway, Maybe. speaking of, let's talk about the Twilight Saga. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we did talk about this a little bit when we talked about novels and fan fiction too, because it was a Hermione Draco fan fiction, I remember. <laughs> but Twilight has definitely, definitely made an impact. According to one Screen Rant article, Eclipse, New Moon, Breaking Dawns, Parts 1 and 2 all take up a slot in their top highest grossing romance films of all time. So what is their appeal? Well, you've got vampires and werewolves and love triangles. All of it. Oh, my. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth when it comes to the love-hate of this series, but the appeal begins with the book and its ability to tap into a young girl's desire to be fiercely wanted. What girl doesn't want to be the one that changes someone's behavior or be someone's obsession? And yes, taken into the context of everyday real life, this is really creepy and disturbing. We've talked about that before. But here it is a safe space to see your characters that you're so attached to come to life, go through all this turmoil, and eventually get that, that happy ending. And this was meant for young girls, teenage girls, girls who were just learning about romance and their own feelings and desires. And here was this specific book, this specific series that allowed them to question and even dig deeper to what their desires might be. And even more so, they have superpowers. There's an element of fantasy that you wished existed, infused with love. Oh, love. <laughs> and it was, for the lack of better words, emo. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. So many teenage tragedies, dramas, and inner conflicts. As a hormonal teenager, I think this speaks to them. There's a lot of complicated emotions, and trying to decipher them is painful. And here are these characters who lean into that. Eh, but it's problematic too, yes. And we can all agree, a dude coming into your room without permission to watch you sleep is not okay. And virginal conversation. But it doesn't mean it's not entertaining. Right. And obviously, the author, Stephanie Meyer, is hoping for a still loyal fan base as she is set to release Midnight Sun. So we'll see if it still has that draw. Uh, by the way, um, I actually read the leaked copy of this <laughs> probably like, I don't know, 10 years ago. <laughs> I don't think I may have Samantha. it printed out somewhere in here. <laughs> Look, my job was really boring. And I was like, what? I definitely got into this as a 20-year-old. And it was really fun to look through people's reaction mm. from back then. Because I think the anniversary was 2018. A 10-year anniversary happened then. And people came back and talked about what the pillow was or what the what they didn't like about it. And there was one 20-something. She said she was 20-something years old when she was introduced to it. And the appeal of it was that it was such a fantasy, such an easy read that you truly could escape. And knowing that this was not me, obviously, I was not a teenager at that time, so it wasn't necessarily made for me. But mm -hmm. it was nice to think of, huh, man, that would have been nice as a teenager. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's definitely appeal to that. And, and it'll be interesting if Midnight Sun actually takes off. And let's talk about the series Bridgerton, which yes. Annie has been waiting for, I yes. think, quite excitedly. I have no uh, idea what it is. <laughs> <laughs> which, according to Netflix, had more than 82 million accounts that watched Bridgerton in the first month. And apparently, uh, the numbers could be a little skewed because the way they count it is if you mm. watch for four minutes, <laughs> they count oh, it as a viewing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how correct these numbers are, but it can't be denied as popular. Yes. It is very popular. We've seen the quizzes, we've seen the comments, and there's going to be a season two. And people are quite <laughs> excited about it. So for those of you who don't know, specifically you, Annie, a yes. quick rundown, without spoilers, 
maybe a few minor ones, okay? Mm -hmm. This is a historical series based on books written by Julia Quinn and produced by Shonda Rhimes, part of the Shonda Land Productions. It is set during the Regency era, following the lives of the Bridgerton family. And we're quickly introduced to the two main characters, Daphne Bridgerton, who is deemed the diamond of the season, which is during the marriage season when they're all courting, courting season. And the new Duke of Hastings after his father's death, Simon Bassett. For a quick description, a Jane Austen style of romance with sex. Lots of very coordinated and unrealistic sex. (laughs) That's what I've heard about it. (laughs) The show is narrated by a gossip writer who calls herself Lady Whistledown, who publishes the town's gossip, and it's actually voiced by Julie Andrews. Of course, we follow the main protagonists in their road to love, falling for each other, which begins with some harsh words exchanged to rouse and attract men and then to push away women from the Duke who has no desire to be married. Yeah, his whole narrative is pretty much about his awful relationship with his father, who was a bad man and wanting to end that lineage just to spite him. Uh, oh, so, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so along the way, we get to meet the entire Bridgerton family and their different storylines, which, by the way, apparently is how the series goes, including the sister Eloise, who wishes not to be married or become those girls who spend their time looking for a husband, but desires to go to the university and be independent. So she's kind of that Jane Austen character that you think of as the mm. lead. But what makes this series different is the diversity that is within the entire story. The most powerful person in society is the queen, Queen Charlotte, a black woman. And this diversity is a part of the storyline. It's talked about between the black characters, but there's a definite back and forth on how it's being received from the audience or for the people who are watching it. Some have praised it as we know this type of representation has not been seen in, in shows and movies like these. But at the same time, it's kind of dismissive of the issues that were present during this time. And also it does seem like the fact that the black characters are the ones that happen to grapple through this and have this conversation and the white characters are like, eh, eh, I just need yeah. this dress. I'm, you are poor, you know what I mean? Which is still bad sure. this year, don't get me wrong. But it's definitely something that is intersectional for many of the communities and characters inside of that story. So there's a big back and forth. Yeah, and it seems that the diversity is seen as one of the appeals of the show, as well as the beautiful sets and the costumes. And yes. <laughs> and yes, by the way, it makes me want to speak as if I too was coming out and about to attend a ball, though I believe I would now be counted as a spinster. Oh. Still attend a ball. Yeah. Would I? <laughs> Not if I'm out in society. Ugh. I'm going to be a spinster. Shake the system up. <laughs> uh, and to say these movies and shows have a lasting impact is an understatement. But as we see that the level of popularity of romantic movies seem to be dwindling and seem to have dwindled, seeing the success of shows like Bridgerton and now adjusting to a new way of seeing movies, just because we're not at theaters anymore, we're streaming. Right. I do wonder if we will see an increase in interest in romantic movies on a wider scale. We know that YA novels have been flipped a lot into movies recently and are mm-hmm. some of the higher viewing movies on Netflix as well, whether it's uh, To All the Boys That I've Ever Loved, which has a great Asian protagonist, like all of these things, and it's bringing up a new era of romantic movies. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, especially in the wake of, as you say, a traumatizing pandemic, what will get <laughs> created and what people will want. But yeah, yeah, we'll see. And I did want to honorably, honorable mention of The Bachelor. I know a lot of people like it. And that is an interesting aspect of like romance and courtship. And why do people love that? Because it's so popular and there's tons of podcasts specifically about The Bachelor. Yeah. So maybe a future episode, perhaps. And Fifty Shades of Grey and the panic around that whole thing, which I remember being in the airport and there was a CNN... A report and they were like, what are we going to do about all these soccer moms reading Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> I mean, there is a conversation <laughs> about the way sex and the way it's portrayed does appeal. Again, we I didn't really get into the whole conversation of sex within Bridgerton and how I said it is unrealistic, but it's still <laughs> quite enjoyable. Uh-huh. But that also can lead to the conversation about how it's filmed, in which we have talked about doing this as episode as well, and how yeah. it looks like to be a part of these scenes. But uh, I do have to ask you, I went to a site because I wanted mm-hmm. to see who were the most loved characters, specifically male characters in like any of the genres, any of the shows. Do you know, can you name the top five? Of, of what? Any all genre? Of them, all movies, yes. I just wanted to know, like, specifically, like, they would give up their relationship for these characters. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to know, oh, no, you know them. Um, no. 
No. <laughs> well, actually, the top five, four of them are MCU characters, and one of them is a supernatural character. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, so the top one was Thor, and number two was Dean Winchester. Really? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. So it's one of these sites that you can go on and they do the upvotes. And there was like mm-hmm. thousands and thousands and thousands of people going on there. Yeah, I was very wow. surprised by that. I am as well. Thor's not who I would go for, but you know, good arms, good face, <laughs> lots of good things going on. I understand. I mean, I, he's chubby know, now too. So lovable. Well, he was chubby. I, I feel like the personality is so key to me, though. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we have a lot of other video game-based stuff to talk about. <laughs> but first, we're going to pause for a quick break for word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. So, yes, we, ha- we have to talk about video games. While romance is not the center of most video games I play, it does usually have a, a decent role and sometimes a very significant one. In my experience, the playable character is usually a male and the romantic interest is a hot woman who, while capable, also probably serves as the damsel in distress. And you can see our Princess Peach slash Princess Toadstool episode for one of the most iconic examples on that. And quite possibly dies to kickstart the male revenge plotline. While there are amazing female characters in some of these narratives, that doesn't change the fact that by nature, most of the protagonists are playable characters being male. Because of that, it means that the romance in most of these games is seen through a male lens. On the other hand, there are plenty of games where your choices impact who you end up with. Depending on the game, there can be a diverse pool of candidates. And there are games that are romance games, like straight romance games where you get like heart points, I don't know any of those, so I'm not going to be discussing them. But I will try to highlight bigger examples from games that I have not played. So let's get into it. One of the reasons that we wanted to talk about video games specifically, and I was like, you know what? We need to talk about this with this romance. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who was recently on Hot Ones, one of my favorite shows, was talking about the impact of the internet, the impact of things like YouTube and other forms of viewing and storytelling. He specifically said that he thought the new wave of storytelling would come specifically from video games and RPGs. And so I found that interesting because that is a big conversation as I witnessed you yes, and my partner getting real into The Last of Us and him loving Witcher and now Cyberpunk. Like, it's something that I have watched. And then we know many listeners and many of gamers, they fall in love or really, really feel empathy towards these characters. And it is. It kind of is like, wow, it's creating a whole new form of entertainment and a whole new way of finding the romance genre within these Mm -hmm. things. And one of those things is choose your own. I feel like that might be one that would be up my alley, uh, which is a subset of romance games, which is either a point-based or open-world system in which your actions ultimately influence who you end up with romantically or don't, or don't, which I've kind of asked people repeatedly, why do you do this? Is a video game. I don't understand. But if, as we talked about, if this is a storytelling and this is a mm-hmm. new format of storytelling and it is more involved because it is an RPG, then that makes sense. And so we're going to do some spoilers for some of these games. Yeah. No, I feel like I really, I really mess up where I forget that not everybody <laughs> has played these games as much as I have. But yeah, it is interesting to see like HBO is going to make The Last of Us and Witcher on Netflix. Like we are seeing them. For so long, video game movies have been looked down on, but... Right. Which, by the way, The Witcher was the highest viewed before Bridgerton. Bridgerton? Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. There you go. All right. So one of my favorite games of all time is Final Fantasy VII. And it's so complicated, but the, the brief, briefest thing, this is part of a long-running role-playing series that are based in fantasy worlds and usually involve you try to save the world. They're not normally connected to each other. They're kind of standalones. So in Final Fantasy VII and the recently released remake that I put in quotes, the main playable character is Cloud. And remember, Samantha, how you helped me get him on Super Smash Brothers? Yeah, I was very confused about what we were doing, but we did it. We did it. So Cod is a no-nonsense mercenary. He doesn't talk a lot. Throughout the game, you have multiple opportunities to influence who you as the main character, Cloud, end up with romantically or have romantic situations with. The two main characters in the running are Cloud's childhood friend, 
Tifa, who is a scrappy fighter and a member of an environmental organization trying to save the world, and Eris slash Aerith, this is English mistranslation, who is a kind flower woman who is also an ancient world power connected to the planet which is dying. Tifa is dressed very provocatively, like really big boobs, like the animators went wild in the original with the boobs. Um, also the first person I ever went to Dragon Con as. <laughs> I did not have the boobs. I was going to say, her. was the boobs the appeal? No, I just like Tifa. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, also, her costume was really easy. I'll be, I'll be real, real with you. It's basically just a crop top and short shorts. <laughs> All right then. <laughs> okay. While Aerith is in shades of pink and red, um, she's more innocent in her portrayal. I would say Aerith is the easiest to end up with. Like, if you aren't actively trying to end up with someone else, uh, you'll probably get her. And that's part of the tragedy of her dying. <gasps> Spoiler alert. And, and that's a very dramatic storyline. I cried and cried. I will never forget that moment. <laughs> but outside of them, you can also end up with Yuffie, who is this flighty thief, or Barrett, who is a gruff, crass, big dude with guns for arms. And these romantic point opportunities occur at a few key points. One is, one of the big ones that's near the beginning of the game, when you as Cloud are trying to sneak into this real sketchy guy's house, the Don, who chooses women to spend the night with him. So you're trying to get him to choose you. So you essentially have to dress as a woman. You get a dress made, you get your hair done, all that. And based on dialogue choices you pick and other choices you make, that influences your future romantic prospects. And later, you choose someone for a date, same thing. I will say the Barrett option is treated as a joke because he is a man, but he's also a really gruff man that as the player, I think you're meant to assume would be really embarrassed to be thought of as gay. It's just the vibe I got. I haven't played the original in a long time, but I do seem to remember some homophobic jokes in there, like making fun of Cloud dressed as a woman, but also laughing at perceived gay characters' expenses. In the remake, there's less of that going on, but... I thought it was worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. It's safe to say the romance between Aerith, who is the total opposite of Cloud, makes him see beauty in the world again, all that. And Cloud is the one that the game is guiding you to, and it is more memorable and sad. I suppose it's another example of killing a love interest to jumpstart the main male character's story. And she does spend much of the game in peril, but she definitely has a story of her own, and she doesn't die until midway through a very long game. <laughs> okay. It's the second disc of three discs, and I think it's at the <laughs> end of the second disc. <laughs> okay, so there's one. Also, the Mass Effect series, which is one of my favorite series. And I know people hated the ending, don't at me. <laughs> We're focusing on the main three games here. So the way these games work is that a choice you make in the first game can impact who dies in the third one. And let me tell you, I didn't know that when I first started playing, and I made some reckless decisions, and I got very angry about it. <laughs> So when you start out, you get to design your character. You can choose male, female, how they look, etc. The default is male, but I played as the female version of the main character, Shepard or Fem Shep, as she's called. And throughout the games, you can have multiple partners. You can have flings. You can have long-term relationships. I played through every romance possible with aliens, both female and male, and non-gendered or monogendered. I do think there is one clear heteronormative frontrunner in every game. But they were always the least interesting, in my opinion. I liked Garrus, who is sort of reptilian male alien, or Liara, who is a blue female alien or monogendered alien. And I've told Samantha this, but there's a scene in the second game where you have to go to a doctor to talk about how to have sex with an alien, and he recommended lube. Lube is great. I bet that's good advice. In general. <laughs> In general. But yes, you pursue these relationships primarily through dialogue options, who you choose to go on missions with, who you talk to, and how often, things like that. Right. And in the first game, you only had a handful of choices, which is probably why you made such a bad choice. Well, I punched this reporter in the face, and for some reason that really impacts <laughs> something in the third game. To the no point better. I went to the coding and changed Oh, wow. I changed it. <laughs> okay, okay. But by the third game, Dude Shepard had nine choices and Fim Shep had seven. Why less? Well, a little bit of uh, conservatives freaking out, actually. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah, inequality. And the second one cut a same-sex sex scene in a romance option because apparently, yeah, the Fox News freaked out about it and really hammered at it and said, no, this is bad. And the headline on the talk show, Chiron, about it was sex box? Yeah. I, I, I see the pun. 
And this is something to note. Most of the romance culminate in actual cutscenes, and some with sex, others without. Yeah, so essentially there's actually a video that you watch where they have sex, if, which is rare in in this world of <laughs> video game romance that I dabbled in, not in the <laughs> video yeah. game romance world. I've definitely asked questions of like, why? But I mean, it's it's rare in terms of like you could end up with seven different people and pretty much everyone would have a sex scene. Right. You could watch. Right. But moving on to Oxen Tree, which is a game I've talked about before. I absolutely adore it. But in terms of the romance of this game, you play as a female high schooler. And depending on the choices you make in dialogue bubbles, you can influence who ends up together and who you end up with or don't end up with. And you can really mess up relationships. You can really mess up relationships. Um, <laughs> Because you get hints on who like like likes each other and you can push them towards each other or push them away from each other and purposely mess with their relationships. And because you're playing as sort of a quirky outsider, while the other two girls in the group are kind of it girls or cool girls and one of them you have a real axe to grind with, we'll say, you can choose to be a vengeful god or benevolent matchmaker, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> And then there are some that aren't so much choose your own, but they're kind of iconic video game romance storyline examples. And one of them is another favorite of mine, Final Fantasy X. At the heart of this is a romance between the Grand Summoner Yuna and her guardian Titus, which I know is like the English way to pronounce it, but that's just how I pronounce (laughs) it. Throughout the game, you watch their relationship grow from first meeting to Titus coaxing laughter out of Yuna and this really long, awkward laughing scene, but it's sweet. Stopping her from marrying this gross guy named Seymour to, like, a really tame but beautiful sex scene. I'm not sure they really had sex, but it had that vibe. It had right. the vibe, Samantha. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> to realizing that their love was doomed. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, oh no. Being the Grand Summoner means that Yuna will die. And Titus has been protecting her so that she can survive to die in this ritual, which he did not realize. Titus is determined to break the cycle, but in doing so... He sacrifices himself slash realizes he's a dream. It's very complicated. Wow. The music of their romance is beautiful too, but okay. So Final Fantasy X, you lose Titus. They're torn apart. Let's talk about Final Fantasy X too, which at the time was a really dramatic departure from all other Final Fantasy games. It was trying so hard to be cool. I really want to do a whole episode on it because there's so much I could say. But for this episode's purposes, Yuna is the main character along with two other women. And she joined up with these women to search for any trace of her lost love, Titus. The fighting mechanic is outfit-based, Samantha. Oh. Uh, and there's a huge concert that you all have to sing at, of course. So you got to like practice dance moves and singing. But I wanted to include it because it does feel like Yuna is in the wake of lost love and she's trying to figure out how to move on or not move on. And if you do everything just right in the game, you can get a cut scene at the end of her reuniting with Titus. Though it's up for debate whether he's real or still a dream. And did I do this? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> do I have the song they sing at the concert in my music library? Uh Uh-huh. I sure do. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's been a long time since I played this game, but I still remember thinking, well, at least in the first one, Yuna was pretty badass. She did fit in the role of the healer and sort of a softer attack person, and she did more protection spells, but she was also the summoner. And she wore feminine clothes, but not too revealing ones, which did change in 10-2, and the clothing was much more revealing. But there were also a million costumes to choose from, each with their own set of powers and abilities. Some of them are quite, quite silly, and others culturally insensitive. So, there's that. That's not surprising. (laughs) God, I want to talk about that game so much. But no, we're going to talk about Kingdom Hearts now, which is a series where you play mostly as Sora, a young male. You probably, even if you haven't played this game or heard of it, you've seen the videos of trying to explain Kingdom Hearts because it is very complicated. But in the game, you can visit all kinds of Disney worlds, like you can visit Beauty and the Beast, Frozen, Rapunzel, Hercules. You can run into characters from all sorts of Disney and later Square Enix titles like Final Fantasy. I was really hoping to see Star Wars and Marvel show up after Disney bought them, but alas. In the first game, you have your young love story between Kyrie and Sora, and they're kind of like childhood sweethearts in love forever as soon as they met. And after Kyrie is captured at the beginning of the game, along with six other princesses to be used for their hearts to kickstart bad stuff, 
You spend much of the game trying to save her, and in the end, she sort of kind of saves you, I guess, by giving you her heart. Or it's your heart, but it's been living inside of her, so you can bring her back. Complicated. I always thought it was a little weird how little time these two characters spent together throughout the series, and yet they are still head over heels in love with each other. Although there is, like, melancholy and longing hanging over their relationship, and with some hinting she might be interested in their best friend. Riku, who is a dude. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. no. So, a uh, Silent Hill 2, which we discussed in our Women in Survival Horror episode. But I'm going to mention it again because this is something else that we see a lot when it comes to women in romance and video games. This is also a point-based system, but ultimately, you as the male PC have to confront your wife and the fact that you killed her. And depending on the choices you make, she's the monster you have to overcome, and you might end up with a really one-dimensional, sexy, annoying version of her. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Something else we talked about in the Women in Survival horror episode, and I've talked about a lot, is, yes, The Last of Us 2. So briefly, these games are essentially movies that you play. So you don't have choices in who you end up with. In the DLC of the first game, which is downloadable content, uh, you play as 14-year-old Ellie, and you see the budding romance between her and her best friend Riley, and also her realizing or maybe coming into the fact that she is queer. Of course it ends tragically when Ellie and Riley are bitten by zombies and they agree to lose their minds together. But as Riley becomes a zombie, Ellie learns she is immune. In the second one, Ellie forms a relationship with Dina, who is at the very least bisexual, and we see the strengths and pitfalls of their relationship. They settle with a child and they have a chance at yeah, a happy life or about as happy as you're going to get in this world. But Ellie chooses a chance at revenge over her new family. And it's really painful as a player because you're like, no, Ellie, you can be happy. Don't do this, but you have to play it because it's how video games work. When Ellie returns home, Dina and their son are no longer there. And this relationship was really new and revolutionary in terms of representation in video games. On the other hand, you have Abby, and we Abby, see the Abby, rise Abby, and fall. Abby. Oh, Abby, Abby, Abby. One of our listeners is playing this right now, and she <laughs> it's fun. I'm, I'm getting her <laughs> updates, and I'm like, ah, so much you have to go through. <laughs> um, yeah, we see the rise and fall of her relationship with Owen and her choosing revenge over happiness time and time again, eventually leading to Owen's death, just as Abby has decided to go with him and pursue a hopeful future with the Fireflies. And also, there's an anal sex scene between them. Yeah. Did I know it was anal sex? I mean, you, we watched it, didn't you? It's pretty... We can discuss this later. <laughs> uh, that is a real big detail. I didn't realize I was there. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I kind of slipped in and out of that one. Um, another game... <laughs> <laughs> Pun intended. Gone Home. This is a game where you return home after being deployed for a while and you find the house empty. Oh no. Using notes and recordings, you piece together what happened. And what's really cool is at first it plays like a haunted house game, but as you play, you learn your younger sister has fallen for a young woman and because she felt unaccepted by her religious family, she ran away with her. And it's a bittersweet coming out story of young love. Yeah. Young love. Yeah. And then... Some recommendations I got when I was researching women romance and video games that I have not played, but I thought I'd mention. Witcher 3, yes, Wild Hunt, a 2015 game that I own but have yet to play. So depending on the choices you make, you can end up with Triss, your longtime go-to, or a blast from the past, Sorceress Yennefer, or lose both, or choose to go it alone, I suppose. From what I understand, there's a lot of potential female partners for main character Gerald, and I, I can't remember if... This is the one that has, like, all the weird sex in it. Anyway. Uh, If I remember correctly, and I don't remember correctly often, um, (laughs) just to go ahead and put that caveat out there, when I was watching my partner play it, he would pick the sex scenes and all of that, and I was like, why? What's happening? And there was a lot. Yeah, that's what I seem to recall. There was a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Well, this whole old versus new romance, like the person from your past and the new one, Plus, the lighter versus darker dynamic seems pretty common in video games, and I'd say a lot of romantic uh, entertainment. It also shows up in Far Cry 3, when the protagonist Jason is torn between his old love, Liza, who he needs to save, and his new love, the darker Citra, who is a priestess on the island he gets marooned on. I haven't played this game, so I can't speak to the betrayals of these women. According to the summaries I read, you do have to face Liza in a dream, maybe, as a monster. And again, there's this sort of thread of women holding men back in these romance stories. But there may have also been magic going on through Citra, who sounds like she plays the role of the seductress. 
And it also sounds like a case of women being played against women and the classic triangle that we're seeing pop up again and again. That's the male character. You have multiple women to choose from. You gotta make your choice. In the game's end, Citra dies for Jason, but if you allied with her, the two have ritualistic sex after Jason killed Liza, but then Citra kills Jason, telling him their child will lead the tribe to glory. Women are out to seduce you, take your sperm, and kill you. Is that romance? I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, obviously. I think that's romantic. <laughs> that's my idea of romantic. <laughs> what? Is that a problem? No. <laughs> and then we can talk about the Uncharted series. Uh, Drake and Elena spend a lot of these games saving each other, which is nice, but both are competent and capable on their own. Elena becomes an international investigative journalist, and they have a relatively, quote, normal relationship for a video game. So I'm, I'm interested to see what that, that would be. Florence, a game about the ups and downs of a relationship where you piece together dialogue bubbles. Yeah, by the way, those confuse me because I'm like, wait, you have to choose one or the other? What's happening? What's happening? Mm-hmm. What's happening? <laughs> and then there's a Stardew Valley, which is a game all about romance. You have the option to build friendships or relationships, get married, but none of these is permanent and you can be rejected and marriages can fall apart like real life. Mm-hmm. Talking, running errands, asking a character to dance are all ways you can build up these relationships. That kind of sounds like Red Dead Redemption that uh, my partner really likes. I've been watching him play that too, in which I always root for the animal to eat him. Apparently, that's not a good... <laughs> oh, so <Way> romantic. Go. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also Dragon Age Inquisition, which is kind of a fantasy version of Mass Effect. The mechanics are similar. Apparently, playing as a female elf gives you the most choices of partners at 11, compared to human females, 5. Although some relationships in this game have been called out for queer baiting or racism. Also, Sims 4, you can control the pace of your romance and who you romance, pregnancies, all kinds of things. I like the Sims uh, memes. They make me fun. <laughs> then there's Catherine, an adult puzzle game where you play Vincent, who is torn between committing to his longtime girlfriend, Catherine, and the mysterious woman he had an affair with. Catherine. One with a K, one with a C. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. okay. Um, And after his long-time girlfriend leaves him, he realizes C. Catherine is a succubus, (laughs) obviously. Um, And the endings you can get are, sounds like very... They're interesting very interesting. <laughs> and this kind of reminds me of the new phone games that I've been seeing, which are romantic story phone games, puzzle mm-hmm. games, that you have to create this romance. And they yeah. all seem to be, you know, having affairs or being left or all these things. And I find that very interesting as it's become more and more popular, or at least advertised a lot. I don't know what my phone's trying to tell me because <laughs> I've never played those games, but okay. <laughs> Um, and then there's a Waylanders, a newish RPG where you can explore all kinds of relationships and depths of relationships. Pansexual and players play as non-binary or trans, which is pretty freaking cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested to check that one out. Ooh, so that's been kind of a whirlwind through video games, but we do mm-hmm. want to talk about some music. Music! Yeah. But first, we have one more quick break for a word from our sponsor. back. Thank you, sponsor. Let's talk about boy bands. Boy bands. So boy bands make so much money. According to Jason King, a music journalist at NPR, a boy band entails, quote, members that are usually in their late teens, early 20s. Their material appeals to teen and preteen girls. There's usually a manager who puts the group together as opposed to it arising organically. I will say there's a lot of debate actually about that. The term first appeared in the 1980s as part of the gendered marketing of that time, especially to younger folks. And generally the term comes with some stigma, an assumption of lesser for all the reasons we've been talking about, like with rom-coms and chick flicks. Also, BTS, for instance, doesn't fit the description we just read, which has sparked some debate about how non-Anglophone boy bands are different. Right. Oh, and by the way, BTS had such a huge impact in the government of South Korea that they changed the law Yep. That which actually has a young male Korean citizens to be a part of the army and they pushed the age requirement back specifically Uh for BTS saying that they were doing so well for being ambassadors of their country. I found Mm -hmm. that fascinating because that rule, that law has been in place for a long time. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the power of the boy band. Indeed. <laughs> and from Heidi Samuelson at Medium, she says, quote, what about the Temptations, the Ramones, and Blink-182? Are they boy bands? No, probably not, because adults and boys listen to them, too, so obviously not. Yeah, that's a great article, by the way. I highly yeah. recommend it. So we talked about boy bands a bit in our fangirl episode about how women and girls were the first to love the Beatles, often considered the first boy band, and Elvis, but they were dismissed, as were these artists themselves, until male critics and male audiences gave credence to their music. And suddenly the music not only had value, but it's like, I discovered this and it's so good. Mm. And like, ladies, you're ruining it for me. (laughs) The girl and women fans were routinely mocked, and that continues to be the case. And we use this quote from Harry Styles in our fan girl episode, but I love it so much that I want to put it in here again. Who's to say that young girls who like pop music, short for popular, right, have worse musical tastes than a 30-year-old hipster guy? That's not up to you to say. Music is something that's always changing. There's no goalpost. Young girls like the Beatles. You gonna tell me they're not serious? How can you say young girls don't get it? There are future doctors, lawyers, mothers, presidents. They kind of keep the world going. Teenage girl fans, they don't lie. If they like you, they're there. They don't act too cool. They like you and they tell you, which is sick. As well as the fact that they will back you and or money. crush you. <laughs> yes, they will. <laughs> we talked about that in our fan girl episode too. But let's back up a bit and ask the question, why do girls and women love boy bands? Because no matter the era, there's a boy band and legions of women and girls propping them up. The Beatles, Menudo, Jackson 5, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, One Direction, BTS, which by the way is the number one boy band in the world in 2020. In 2019, they became the first band since the Beatles to have three albums at number one on the U.S. pop charts in the same year. And the abuse that can happen within these boy band worlds is a whole separate episode that we should talk about, as well as the fact that bands like this, you see a lot of court cases coming back to talking about how they've been misrepresented or how they've their money's gone because the management were sneaky. That's one way of putting it, yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> no, like underhanded and sneaky and took yeah. a lot away from them. Yes, yes. One reason that these boy bands have such popularity is something that we've been talking about. It's a safe way for young girls and women to explore their sexuality and build identity. And yeah, listen to the lyrics. They're telling you you're perfect, you're amazing, you're beautiful, all these lovely things. Yes, very heteronormative lyrics generally, but it's nice to imagine that A, the lyrics are about you, and B, that some sort of romanticized man who would be so open with his emotions with you exist and that you could be with them. According to Maria Sherman, author of Larger Than Life, A History of Boy Bands from NKOTB to BTS, the history shows that young women have been interested in the sensitive sweetie a very long time. Boy bands can pump out signals almost unparalleled and the members are usually not bad to look at and synchronized dancing. It's almost an extension of the escapist fantasy that we talked about in part one of uh, these episodes, but also in this one. For a minute, you can believe the song is about you and that you could end up with a band member or find someone like him. And I know I've said this before, but Wattpad, which is a fan fiction, like a really popular uh, mobile fan fiction app, I think 90% of the fan fiction on there is about One Direction. I think. It's a lot. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. a lot. By the way, I love a man who can move. Love it. Sexy. But Mm -hmm. Nick Carter, a member of Backstreet Boys, said, quote, people love boy bands because you can relate to at least one member. Boy bands give people the right to be able to choose who their favorites are and who they can relate to. Everyone can find someone that they can call their own. Uh, And you've got the types, the bad boy, the shy one, etc. There's also competitive aspects to that between bands with the members of the bands, standing, if you will. So much standing. Oh, yeah. And shipping. Oh, yeah. And shipping, (laughs) yeah. Yes, and Samantha was an instant girl, and yes. I was a Backstreet Boys girl, and I just had to put in here, Backstreet Boys is the most successful boy band of all time, with over 100 million records worldwide, as of 2020, I think. But you know they I produced find it hard to believe. more. No, because they produced a lot more records, because Justin Timberlake never came back. That's right. Backstreet Boys, I think they did a cruise ship, so... <laughs> They needed money. They kept coming back. And I'm sure the rest of NSYNC would have loved that, but Timberlake did not need them, apparently. So, oh, harsh, <laughs> so that harsh, could harsh. be part of the, the argument is Backstreet Boys is, was still producing music up until not too long ago. Of course, yeah. maybe not so much now that we found out one of them may be a QAnon supporter, but hey. Ugh. 
That's your band. In the world of boy bands. <laughs> that, that's your band. <laughs> and nostalgia is a big part of this too. Like, you know, when whatever NSYNC Backstreet Boys song comes on in karaoke, you're into it. And I did have a lot of fun looking at old pictures from bands of different time periods. And I love asking my mom about the Beatles and Elvis because she was such a huge fan. Oh, my mom was a huge fan of the Monkees. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. That comes yeah. up on the list as well. Mm-hmm. But we had to come back and talk about the appeal of love songs and ballads for women. What is it about love songs that appeals to women and why do we connect with them? So according to one study done by a professor in France, it says that it may have improved one's mood and made them more receptive to a possible romance. And two, it may make them more likely to be agreeable and feeling more generous and likelier to say yes. For his study, he had a group of women listening to music and having positive interactions with each other, then being approached by an average-looking man who asked for their number, and at least 52% gave them their number and then had a group that didn't listen to the music, and only 27.9% gave them the number. Right. So I thought it was interesting because he decided, hey, maybe this can affect whether or not they'll say yes to a date. And and it did. It kind of did affect it. But, of course, nothing has truly been verified and we would need to have further research into it. It's hard to deny that music makes you feel things. I mean, even when you think about, like, the romantic mixtape or mood music for dates or having sex, like, it's just sort of a thing. It is. Mixtape. Oh, the infamous mixtape. I made you a mixtape. I made you a mix CD. How yeah. romantic. Oh. You know me. Oh, how romantic. (laughs) So it's estimated that over 100 million love songs have been recorded in very different variations. Everything from new love to breakup songs to songs of devotion. But then what makes them special? You have singer-songwriters like Taylor Swift who has made a career in her storytelling and songwriting. Teens and adults feel a connection. She speaks their feelings. And as she states in her own songs, these are confessionals, which allows for a connection with the fan. And that's what it's about, having a song that makes the listener feel heard or understood because that's how they felt or that's how they want to feel or that's what they see. And and whether it's the honesty of heartbreak and, and this dude being an, a jerk or the honesty of finding someone you're like why can't it be me which I still have a hard time believing that Taylor Swift isn't the number one girl and puts herself as the number two girl in her songs whatever (laughs) we can all relate And music is therapeutic, whether it's upbeat songs to get you motivated or sad songs that allow you to mourn or release tears. And in fact, researchers said sad songs, quote, induce a biochemical response in empathetic listeners, triggering beneficial hormones. And yes, actually, my fan fiction, my very tragic, absolutely devastating fan fiction, I made a playlist for it. And it is so sad. It is so sad. But I love it. Yeah, I think definitely when I was dabbling in writing, a song might inspire me mm-hmm. to get into that mode. Specific uh, emo bands like Death Cab for Cutie makes you have the storytelling thing, sing song, Decemberist, they do this, uh, where they tell a story within their songs and you feel this, you feel that emotion and you start connecting with, yes, I have a story for that. So I definitely mm-hmm. think we see that and we know that there's a connection in movies and soundtracks and what that brings out, what the emotions bring out. I mean, I've discovered of many artists through soundtracks and I bought yeah. soundtracks oh, yeah. like nobody's business uh-huh. uh, because they yeah. express so much more <laughs> than what I could have said out loud. And I think oh. for women, it's a drive because you get it. It is that open vulnerability that oftentimes we don't see in reality. So therefore, maybe these men who are crooning toward to us, it shows their vulnerability and you just feel so special. Yeah, yeah, like you're really seeing <gasps> their soul. Their sensitive side. <laughs> it can only open up to you, even though everyone's listening to this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so clearly there's so many different, and I want to come back and explore like so many of the things we've talked about in this very broad, hard to wrestle episode. It was a massive topic. We saw a lot of common threads and tropes. And we can see women aren't a monolith when it comes to romance and what people like and what they want to see and hear and play, whatever it is, or read or write. Very briefly, we did have like our quiz results because you sent me two quizzes. Yeah. What Bridgerton family would you know? What family would you be in Bridgerton? Who'd you end up with in Bridgerton? And who would you be in Twilight? Yeah. So I got the Bridgerton family is the one a family I'd end up in. Benedict Bridgerton is going to ask for my hand in marriage. And I got Bella Swan, which I want to read the description. It's from The Guardian. 
When you're not getting yourself in dangerous situations, you often find yourself in the middle of fights between the various people who love you. Make sure your dad approves, though. You're still his baby at heart. Which you've never, never seen this, right? I've never seen Bridgerton or Twilight. I've never read Twilight. I, I think I know generally how it goes down, but... Um, yeah, the father yeah. character is very protective of Bella in this as well. Okay, Charlie. that makes more sense. But yeah, I actually got the same results, all of them. So I find that We're funny. We're very mainstream. <laughs> we are very mainstream, apparently, because <laughs> I also got Benedict, and I love that it didn't explain to me why. It's like, here, you got Benedict. Yeah, cause I, <laughs> I don't know who that is, so I was like, He's the middle son who is an artist. Okay. Sure. Uh, he's I kind don't. of a part of the plot that has a little bit of queer baiting, which has been a kind mm. of conversation within it. So it's interesting. But yeah, there you go. Quizzes. You gotta <laughs> love it. I was like, I'm gonna send you 10,000 quizzes and then I stopped at three. So you're welcome. Well, it's really funny because I'm always like, I don't... It's like, what character would you be in Bridget? And I'm like, I don't know. I like the name of this one. Oh, there were so <laughs> many Twilight, like, how much do you know? And I was like, there's no way I'm sending this to her. She would lose her mind. <laughs> I, yes, I get so competitive. <laughs> well, there you go. That's wraps up our two-parter look at women and romance for now. Perhaps we'll come back and revisit some of these things. But in the meantime, send all of your romantic recommendations Please. and entertainment our way. You can email us at stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Instagram at Stuff Mom Never Told You or on Twitter at Momstuff Podcast. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you, Christina. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff Mom Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 